This episode of Bright Hearth is brought to you by Joe Garrisey with Backwards Planning Financial, Keepwise Partners, Great Toad Tallow, Rooted Pines Homestead, Indigo Sundry Soap Company, and by our supporters at Patreon.com. This is the character of nature, but its fluidity, its roughness, its irregularity will not be true unless it is made in the knowledge that it is going to die. No matter how much the person who makes a building is able to understand the rhythm of regularity and irregularity, it will mean nothing so long as he creates it with the idea that it must be preserved because it is so precious. If you want to preserve a building, you will try to make it in materials that last and last forever. You will try to make sure that this creation can be preserved intact, in just its present state forever. Canvas must be ruled out because it has to be replaced. Tiles must be so hard that they will not crack and set in concrete so that they cannot move. And so that weeds will not grow up to split the paving, chairs must be made perfect of materials which never wear or fade. Trees must be nice to look at but may not bear fruit because the dropped fruit might offend someone. But to reach the quality without a name, a building must be made, at least in part, of those materials which age and crumble. Soft tile and brick, soft plaster, fading coats of paint, canvas which has been bleached a little and torn by the wind, fruit dropping on the paths and being crushed by people walking over it, grass growing in the cracks between the stones, an old chair patched and painted to increase its comfort. None of this can happen in a world which lasts forever. The character of nature can't arise without the presence and the consciousness of death. So long as human images distort the character of nature, it is because there is no wholehearted acceptance of the nature of things. So long as there is not wholehearted acceptance of the nature of things, people will distort nature by exaggerating differences or by exaggerating similarities. They do this ultimately in order to stave off the thought and fact of death. So finally, the fact is that to come to this, to make a thing which has the character of nature and to be true to all the forces in it, to remove yourself, to let it be without interferences from your image making self, All this requires that we become aware that all of it is transitory, that all of it is going to pass. Of course, nature itself is also always transitory. The trees, the rivers, the humming insects, they are all short-lived. They will all pass. Yet we never feel sad in the presence of these things. No matter how transitory they are, they make us feel happy, joyful. But when we make our own attempts to create nature in the world around us and succeed, we cannot escape the fact that we are going to die. This quality, when it is reached in human things, is always sad. It makes us sad, and we can even say that any place where a man tries to make the quality and be like nature cannot be true, unless we can feel the slight presence of this haunting sadness there, because we know at the same time we enjoy it, it is going to pass. Excerpt from The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of of Bright Hearth. How are you doing, babe? I am doing well. How are you? I am doing so good. You know why I'm doing so good? Because you just ate a bowl of cereal? I had like, first of all, it was like four bowls of cereal. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a good point. But secondly, because our friends at Indigo Sundry Soap Company have been able to go full time. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, cool. I didn't even tell you that. I was waiting for this moment. Yeah, that's awesome. To give you the news along with, with everybody. So thanks guys for supporting them. That's Yay. awesome. Um, we're big fans of the Colliers and, and everything they're doing. Uh, if you haven't listened, we did an interview with him a couple episodes ago. And yeah, excited. Garrett has been, he's been like shipping soap until midnight because of you guys supporting that company. And uh, now hopefully he'll be able to only have to ship soap till like 8 p.m. That's cool. So keep it up, guys. Keep it up. We're hoping to have subscriptions out with them as well, too. Um, but, but welcome to another episode. Uh, I hope that that cold open piqued your interest. When Lexi suggested that as a cold open for this episode and I read it, it actually um, shaped some of my thoughts about the topic in, in some interesting ways I hadn't really put together yet. So good stuff. I love that book so much. Tell us a little bit more about that book. What is it? I don't know how to describe it. I cried while reading it. It's a book about mm-hmm. architecture. Okay. But he's talking about like what it is in buildings that stir up a feeling of like the beyond Mm. as a Christian, I would think of it in terms of eternity or like nostalgia for another land. And just how, when humans don't have that in a building, like modern architecture 
we're always at disease in trying to compensate for bad architecture and bad environments and atmosphere and surroundings just further makes the disease of a place more and more obvious. So it's kind of like, it's an amazing book because it puts words to so many things you've always thought about places, but you didn't know why, but it's also an extremely frustrating book because it's like, but why did we have to get to this point in history where everything's ugly? Yeah. But at the same time, it helps you see his, his second book is called a pattern language. It helps you see like, if we can recover these patterns, then we can get back on the good road essentially. So that's why it's the timeless way. It's like, what are the yeah. timeless pieces in a home that make you feel at home? And the, and the beauty is that lost things really can be recovered if they're yes. true things. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They're true. And if they're true and in line with how God created the world. Yeah. Uh, which is really, if you, if you don't recall the, the theme of this season, we're, we're looking through truth, goodness, and beauty, building households specifically that cultivate and defend and radiate truth, goodness, and beauty. We've talked about some of Roger um, Scrutton's work and some of the things he said, like put, putting usefulness first and you lose it. But if you put beauty first, then what you do will be useful forever, that nothing is more useful than the useless. And today's episode is um, probably in the category of beauty, I would say. Yeah. Though it overlaps with truth and goodness as well. You can't so often hermetically seal off truth and goodness and beauty from one another because Beauty is... I don't know, though. Can you pursue beauty for its own sake and that's it? Is something beautiful if it's if it's untrue? Yeah, that's true. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. It's so, just a big question. Yeah. Is something um, that is not good, or you know, is it beautiful or is it ugly? Morality, you know, the goodness also, I think, comes into beauty as well, um, which, which was the only point I'm making there. But, th- but basically, I think this one most solidly fits into the category of beauty. We're, we're really talking about the nature of things. Um, the, the, the way that I wrote down a, th- a thesis for this episode, but we'll probably stray somewhat from this sentence or two, is t- to say that things must be made, understood, and cared for in light of their nature. So they have to be permitted to grow and also to wear out. They have to be permitted to live and to die, to be pruned and to thrive and to fail in their season. So we're talking about understanding the pursuit of beauty in the home, both aesthetic beauty, but also other types of beauty in the context of a productive Christian household by understanding things in light of their nature. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about why everything looks better when it's understood in light of its nature and used in harmony with its nature and then also cared for over the long term in light of its nature. And I think this is something that's true for people and for places and for clothing and for uh, churches and neighborhoods and nations uh, and wives and husbands and friends and companies and acoustic guitars. Like this could apply to a million different things when you understand the nature of things and you work in harmony with the nature of things and care for things in light of their nature, then you'll see beauty. But when you fight against the nature of things, um, and I don't mean you know not taking dominion and cultivating, but when you're fighting against the nature of things and not caring for things in light of their nature, then beauty is difficult to come by. So, Lexi, what, what do you think about all of the jumble of words I just said? And maybe help our listeners grab onto that a little bit. Because I think this is kind of a, what's the word? An esoteric Maybe sounding mm-hmm. to, to people, I think you'll get it once we start talking about it, but maybe a little esoteric at first. Yeah. Okay. So I think the first time I read that, it really dawned on me that beautiful things take maintenance. Mm-hmm. And I think what you're saying is if it's true that what Alexander is saying is yeah. that the nature of things houses people our bodies is to die, then walking in line with that nature would mean you have to give it attention and beauty and Mm -hmm. time and cultivation for something to become lovelier and lovelier. If you're like us, the changing seasons wreak havoc on your skin, leaving us in constant search of a healthy product that actually works. Well, they're onto something at Gray Toad Tallow. 
We're talking about a natural organic option packed with vitamins A, D, E, and K to moisturize your skin. The minimal ingredients are whipped into a velvety balm and have been known to soothe all kinds of skincare needs from psoriasis, eczema, and dry skin to sunburns. Check out graytoadtallow.com and use discount code COSMOS15 for 15% off your order. That's all caps, COSMOS15 for 15% off your order. In the wisdom of the ages, it's written, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety, Proverbs eleven fourteen. Now picture this wisdom applied to your small business. Introducing Keepwise Partners, where we blend the power of professional bookkeeping with the biblical virtue of seeking wise counsel. We understand that running a business is a journey with twists and turns, but fear not. Keepwise is here to be your trusted counsel on the path to financial success as you work to take dominion and build Christendom through your labors. Just as the scriptures encourage seeking counsel from many, we've assembled a team of skilled advisors who will be your partners in prosperity. We'll meticulously manage your finances, ensuring your business books are tax-ready and allow you to make better business decisions. What's more, our team isn't just about numbers. We're about wisdom. We'll help you make informed decisions that honor your values as Bible-believing Christians and steer your business toward growth and prosperity, all while keeping your finances in order. Worried about the cost? Remember, even Proverbs advises prudent planning. KeepWise offers flexible pricing options that'll keep your financial house in order without breaking the bank. Head to keepwise.partners to get started today. That's keepwise.partners, and as always, that is in the description below. If you have a young family like me, you work hard every day to ensure you care for your wife and kids. Providing for a young family is challenging with rising costs. It doesn't look like things are going to change in the future. Maybe you've thought like I have, I wish I'd started investing years ago. My family would be in a better financial position. As they say about trees, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Don't let the benefit of time go to waste on your financial planning for retirement or inheritance for your generations. Joe Garrisey with Backwards Planning Financial has been working with us to make the best plan for our family. He's a Christian who works with one of the largest and most trusted financial service companies in the world. He's been helping Lexi and I work towards our financial goals and helps us navigate the complexities of the markets. Whether you have millions in assets or you're just starting to invest, Joe Garrisey can help you reach your goals to grow the kingdom and leave a good legacy for your generations. Visit BackwardsPlanningFinancial.com. That's BackwardsPlanningFinancial.com. Or call 615-767-2555 to speak with Joe to prepare for the future. The testimonials presented may not be representative of the experience of other clients and are not a guarantee of future performance or success. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. And an example that I would give, I think that all, especially if you're in Utah, it's true everywhere. But if you're in Utah and you're going to an I-15 north or south towards Salt Lake City, actually, from where we are, especially, you'll often drive past like 15 billboards that are all about plastic surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the mommy makeover, because we're Mormon country, so they, they have yep. children, but then they're also very vain, culturally, mm-hmm. Mormons. They're gods and goddesses. Yeah. So the, it, it's, there's a lot of externalism. And um, the result of that is a, is a culture of not just like plastic surgery, but also perfect orthodontics and all yes. the way, yes. like uh, perfect makeup, too much makeup, perfect <laughs> hair, too much hairspray, like all that kind of stuff. So th- I think that's a great example of something where um, the nature of the woman is, because it's almost never talking about men, by the way, the men aren't getting anything tucked or nipped that I'm as aware of, uh, or at least the billboards aren't advertising it. Um the nature of the woman is to be given away. She gives away herself to bear children. And she's like stretched out and then unstretched out and then stretched out and unstretched out. And there's, there's a like massive cost to having and raising children, at least on the front end. Like it seems like a massive cost in terms of your strength. And um, as a, a woman properly obeys her nature, the result of that will be that she's not actually trying to cling to the body of an 18 year old 
until she's 45 and then realizing that even though she tried to and avoided children and all these other things, gravity is still taking hold and things mm-hmm. still. So then she goes and gets five surgeries and then it's like, well, you get to 80 and now you look like you don't look beautiful. <sighs> you look freakish. You look plastic. You look like a, like a, like a mannequin. And so the point is, but compare that with a, a, a woman who has gracefully aged into her silver-haired and white-haired 60s, 70s, 80s with her grandchildren around her, there is another kind of beauty that she truly has. Yeah, and I think that's contentment and gratefulness for like receiving what God has given her. Yes. Instead of fussing about it, I guess. Yeah. And I she- think the I think the gratefulness for where you are actually gives you motivation to then do your duties and do what you can to feel better, to look better, to stay healthy, like to have a good attitude, most importantly, because it's cheerfulness that really ultimately adorns you. Yes. So. So we're talking about really two things mainly in this episode. One is understanding things in light of their nature. We'll talk about what that means. And then we're also talking about how when you do that and then you care for things in light of their nature, um, things that are cared for, uh, and cultivated are beautiful. They have yeah. a beauty that is resident in their nature as it's cared for and cultivated under the hand of man, especially yeah. uh, whom God designed for this work. So, so maybe let's start about by talking about what it means to understand things in light of their nature. And and I'll give you a sentence and then, and then give me what, you know, I'd love your thoughts on this. So when, when I say that, when I say that we need to understand things in light of their nature, Fundamentally, I'm talking about taking the time to understand what it is that you're working with and to deal with that thing in a way that it's fitting to its essence or to its telos, to what God created it for, that everything does better when it's understood, cultivated, and cared for in this way. And I've said that that's true for people, like this huge list of things, churches, neighborhoods, nations, wives, husbands, friends, companies. You could talk about crafts, things you make. You could talk about art you put on your walls. You could talk about um, a home itself. You could talk about a backyard. You could talk about the entryway to a home. You could talk about a kitchen, a dining room table. I mean, understanding this concept will help you understand beauty everywhere. So what, all, what do you think about in terms of understanding things in light of their nature? How does that map onto your thinking with beauty, especially in the home? I think about it in terms of not overlooking design features or thinking about them as flaws, but as design features, like seeing what they're intended for and then working with that instead of trying to get rid of that. Yeah. Trying to get rid of it. It's just going to cause more and more friction. And it's kind of like, well, maybe God put that there for a reason. Can you give us some examples of how that maps on a different, because that's a good principle, how it maps on a different types of beauty and situations. Well, you reminded me of this recently with the kids in the house and I think, is it Proverbs 14, one where there, yeah. Where you were kind of, I was lamenting, like, I feel like I problem solve and clean all day, but there's always something to be cleaned. And you were just reminding me like, that's a design feature, not a bug. Yeah. So that's one real life example of, I could get into like perfection paralysis where I'm like, all right, we're not going to pursue anything beautiful or clean in this home. Because there's always something to clean. So what's the point? But instead, I'm looking at it as a design feature of the fruitfulness in our home and working with it anyways, right? So you're working with with the grain of the nature of the home in our stage of life. You're saying in our stage of life, God has made it such that apparently um, two-year-olds, one-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, ten-year-olds, these people are particularly skilled in dirt. That's one of the things that is on their resume. <laughs> and and God made it that way. God God absolutely think about this. God absolutely could have made it so that people came out, maybe they were the size of babies, but they had the maturity of a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. <laughs> and they'd be like, "Yes, mother, I will uh, organize my shoes." Did, did you see that video I sent you today? I was the- about, I was going to bring it up. <laughs> It was so funny. It was such a perfect example of the nature of things. Describe what you're talking about. It was, about. I think it was a Swedish kindergarten. Yes. 
<laughs> where the kids were all bundled up in their winter gear and they were literally just <laughs> rolling around in mud puddles. It was a mud puddle that was probably six inches deep. Because in Sweden, they always say like, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing because they, they really do just spend way more time outdoors no matter what the weather is. And so that was an example with the kids was like, okay, and at least was, my kids aren't doing that. I was watching it going panicking. Oh, my, I could feel my blood pressure. <laughs> I was just thinking how dirty the dish, not the dishwasher, the uh, washing machine gets washing clothes <laughs> yes, like that yes. because I have washed. That's the thing is oh, I absolutely. have washed clothes like that. <laughs> absolutely. So we're understanding so. in this example, the nature of our children and we are working with the grain of it in order to cultivate and care for it. So we're directing it. Yeah. We're not saying that the nature of a thing should run wild. Yeah. Because nature is a thing as God intended for man to make to take dominion over and cultivate to maximal beauty. Yeah. Yeah, cuz you I think the opposite of this would be just giving up entirely yes. and being like, "Well, it is what it is." And that's why I think Christopher Alexander makes a good point in that passage I read like the Christian, our hope in cultivating any of this, even as we age, even as our homes break down, even as, you know, the closets get messy because all the board games got pulled out. Our hope in reordering those things is that death actually doesn't have the last say. So we don't have to give up. Not that it's not like a prosperity gospel type thing, but it is simply ordering the world because God told us to, because he is victorious in the end. And it's like walking in faith that that's true. Yeah, explain that a little bit more. Well, just like really the decay we see around us, the anti-beauty, I guess, that's not what it's always going to be like. It will be all renewed eventually. And so we're kind of just walking in what God is already doing. Like we're living in alignment with what God ultimately says about reality. It's actually more untrue. You're not living... In reality, if you just give up and say, there's no point in like imposing rhythms on my household to cultivate a clean home, it's, it's not entropy or, or die. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then understanding and working <clears throat> with the nature of things is not about giving way to entropy mm -hmm. or letting things run wild. Yeah. That would be the garden full of weeds. Mm -hmm. It is um, understanding the nature of a thing to the extent where you can now using human creativity and input and direction and yeah. strength, you can now tend that thing to greatness and beauty and goodness and virtue. And our children, we've talked about our children a lot because this, it's a good example of under the beauty really is going to come from understanding them, not crushing their nature or expecting something that's not in their nature, mm -hmm. but then we're directing that nature and growing it and tending it because we know that in coet in their nature, like they're a little seed, and in that seed is a is a man or a woman mm -hmm. that's going to come up and sprout up out of this little body. They're going to become a, a potentially someone who will be a great glory mm -hmm. or a great misery mm -hmm. as an adult, and they're all of their capacities for goodness and uh, and beauty and glory are going to be expanded as they grow along with their potential for evil and sin and corruption and defilement. And so what we're doing is we're working with the grain of the nature that they've been given in order to cultivate beauty in their lives. Let, I think let's talk a little bit about some closer to earth or more practical and direct observations for this, because I think it helps see the connection to beauty. Because that book you're reading is literally a design book, you know, more or less. It's like an architectural... Let's talk about how uh, understanding the nature of things in your home, and mm -hmm. I mean in literally the way we build a home, decorate a home, organize a home, um, can either be tended by, by understanding the nature of the thing towards beauty or by ignoring it and running roughshod over the nature of the thing towards ugliness and dysfunction. Do you, mm -hmm. Are there any examples you can think of in a home practically I have some, if, if you don't off the top of your head, but I think you probably do. Okay, so I just read an article the other day about how post-COVID, everyone suddenly, like the new builder grade homes are going back to closed yeah, um, yes. floor plan. And I think one perfect example of not working with the nature of a person is modern open floor plan living. Mm -hmm. Because 
for two reasons. One is nobody's home anymore. Nobody's home to know that it's bad architecture. Yeah, th- th- this arose out of a culture where nobody was home. Yeah, so t- so to them, they're like, it doesn't really matter because they're not going to be there very long anyways, so we'll just make it ugly anyways. Number two, open floor plans do not work with the nature of a person. Mm. They're not cozy. They're not conducive to being in small places. They're not conducive to small places developing you know, relationships together, being able to go off brother and sister into the alcove and read a book together or play Legos. You don't have that in open floor plan. And it's extremely, it's, it's frustrating. It is a design. I don't understand how it's worked. It's all chaos. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is all chaos. I, I found that just super interesting because it was, it was, they were basically, the observation was that after COVID, when everyone was forced to be home, they realized nobody liked their home anymore. Because they were trying to work at home, but they had no small, cozy place to be productive. Yeah. And they were constantly forced to be around people all of the time because everything is so open. And I just was like, well, no, duh. That's not how people are. Because I know how people are because I know the person who made people. But, I mean, really, modern architecture is a godless form of design. And so they don't know that though. So it was truly like a big experiment on creatures. And I, I don't, I don't want to keep going. Well, but I have more thoughts. Open office plans are like this too, where companies that switch to and schools that did that, where it was like multiple classes in one. Yeah, they just said, "Here's a big open room. We're going to have some tables and things set up," and the result is not good. Yeah, it's not good. But really you know, so think about a home and the way that that uh, homes function. Think about the nature of the people and the purpose of the home. What's it for? And you go back to a traditional architectural style of a home. What did you have? Okay, you walk in the front door, and we could talk about entryways for probably 15 minutes. But let's just yes. say, let's skip through the entryway There's for now. There's a whole philosophy of transition barriers yeah. in homes. that. <laughs> so we're going to skip right over that. And maybe we'll talk about that on our, Man, our, our guys. On in the kitchen. Man. Maybe Lexi can talk about entryway transition spaces in, in the kitchen for the patrons. But so... You walk in, and in a traditional home, there'd often be a sitting room. You know, you have a transition entry where you'd have some sort of sitting room. This is where guests might come in. It's a formal sitting room. Because there was a value of hospitality. Yes. (laughs) So you have a room like that. What other kinds of rooms are you going to find? Well, you're going to find a dining room that is built for people to eat in. And typically, it's built for a large family to eat in. So with guests. So it's the kind of room where there's going to be a long table at it. It's going to be a place where you could seat, depending on the size of the house and w- what kind of community it's in, you know, eight to 20 people, maybe more in some big manor houses are going to be able to eat at this table. You'd go back through, there'd be a kitchen in another room, and it's not the same room as the dining no, area. No, So people could cook and prepare, and then they could also bring out a curated, beautiful um, array yeah. to serve the people there and keep some of the, the operational mess uh, mm-hmm. and, and the stress that comes with that for the homemaker. Yeah, I think it definitely is a picture of Sabbath in that you're going to sit down at a table to feast together. You're leaving the work mentally and visibly yeah. behind. And it's not an imposition to the guests either. They can really sit and be guests and not feel like, oh, I can see her working over there. I better oh, I, go help I, her I in the kitchen. I see the sink full of dishes. <laughs> I see the stove. You know, and you start thinking about that. You have an office where... Um, work might be done or a, a sitting room in a library where a reading might be done. And I know it sounds like I'm describing only millionaires' houses, but this is not true. Normal houses were built where they would have many of these discrete rooms. You yes. might not have a whole library yeah. in, in, a, in a smaller home, but you would find spaces like this. And what's happening is that architects, and often the architect, by the way, was just the father <laughs> building what everybody built because he learned this from his father, from his community. Mm-hmm. They were building reverse engineering from the human nature exactly forward to the building so that the building served the people. What we tend to do now is we reverse engineer things from Instagram pictures yeah. to the thing yeah. and not the actual use of the thing because big open... Homes like this photograph really well. Like mm-hmm. they look really sexy in magazines and Instagram pictures and this high and modern and clean and stark and everything's, you know, buttoned up and beautiful and 
But but when you get into this home and you start working in it day in and day out, particularly if you use a home the way that people were meant to, yeah, which is to have lots of people and to be there and you know for there to be uh, not just people leaving in the morning and then everybody comes back for a, an hour at the night, you know, and then sleeps. You start to realize why people built homes that way. Mm -hmm. We're knocking all of the walls down in these homes that they built and turning them into open homes. But they built them because they understood human nature. They understood the nature of the thing they were working with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good example of what we're talking about here. Understanding things in light of their nature and cultivating beauty. So Lexi, we had a conversation the other day about governments getting involved in architecture post-war. I was wondering if you might reiterate some of that here uh, because I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. Well, I think it's interesting that you just talked about certain patterns of home life being handed down father to father, uh -huh. just because there's so much about the modern architecture movement that was literally the government trying to step in as a savior to save the culture post-war. Hmm. That's like a lot of what a lot of the architecture we get today, based on my very minimal understanding, came directly from Germany with post-war reconstruction. They kind of said, you know, we're going to give you guys affordable housing. OK, but who why is it your job to do this? First of all, <laughs> <laughs> second of all. OK, but like affordable to who and how are you actually going about getting that money? Third of all. It's not like the same thing. If if it's ugly, it's not useful for the long run. Yeah. So, and I was just reading in another book last night about they were tracing the different decades from like 1910 all the way to 2010. Yeah. And it, it truly is wild how you can see everything is so ugly after the war. And it's all like all the names of the styles are based on different government things which mm. I didn't know that that was kind of new to me. I did know about like, I did know about early German reconstruction, but it's just like who, why is that their business to like develop all these new design options for us? Who, who told them to do that? And it's horrible. And, and it truly is like, I guess what I, I guess my point is that like when the government, it's not in the government's nature to do that. That's not within the purview that the Lord gave to government. So when they start getting involved in stuff like that, it's not actually more beautiful. They're not actually working with the nature of the world, their job, the people that they're supposed to be serving. It actually does more harm than good. They're typically going to legislate or regulate around issues like efficiency. Yes. Cost. Yes. Energy efficiency. When you start talking about a lot of made up kind of ideas or things that are important, the carbon footprint yes. of a building, for example, or... And and what's interesting, what you find is that in Wrath of Non on Twitter, if any of you guys are familiar with his account, Wrath of G-N-O-N, um, talks a lot about architecture and communities and walkable spaces and human urbanism and a lot of these things. Um, he will point out things like, okay, you get in and you say, we're going to make an energy efficient home. It's going to be like a, a completely sealed box that doesn't have natural exchange of environment between the outside and the in. Yeah. It's going to have, and then you, you start, you say, okay, and this is going to save us 18% on energy bills to heat and cool this home. And then you look at traditional building methods and things. And, and you find that, wow, the way that we actually used to build things was so much more efficient, not because the home was 18% more efficient to heat and cool, but because it was often built with materials you could find right there in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. Areas developed their own character because some places it yes. was rammed earth because that was the building material that was available. Some places it was stone. Some places it was thatch and, and, and wood and timber because they had a lot of timber and they had a lot of these materials. And you find that these buildings, a few things proves true. Because they're, again, they're understanding the nature of their environment they're building in. They're not trying to import the lunar surface or a hospital mm -hmm. room to the, to, the, to the home site. They're looking around and going, what's here? What could we make a house out of? Right? That's understanding the nature yeah. of a place. And then they build them in ways that are beautiful because they're harmonious with their environment. And so people don't want to knock them down and rebuild them every 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that turns out to be, and people want to use them because they're beautiful and they're nice to be in. And it turns out that that's a whole lot more efficient and even energy efficient 
than building plastic homes every 50 years and knocking them down. Yeah. Oh. And uh Yeah, um Christopher Alexander has a big point about like if you can't physically change your space without needing a professional, it's probably not a timeless way of building. Mm, give some examples. Like steel beams. You yeah, and I you couldn't really... move a steel beam with our own hands in the house if we wanted to remodel. If most people, if they want to do any sort of renovation, most people need a professional. Mm -hmm. So he's he's like so far that he's like anti-architect. Uh-huh. Which I can see he has a case for it. Um, but but I understand what he's saying. Like on a more human scale, humans should be able to alter their surroundings to leave a footprint there. People... We don't we don't want to be like that's what we're supposed to do in the world is cultivate and steward and be here in the world, not you know. Yeah. Not here. Are you tired of all the plastic toys that are cheaply made in China? How about the greenwashing that comes with wooden toys covered in harmful chemicals, yet claiming they're safe for littles because the FDA said so? Well, look no further. At Rooted Pines Homestead, husband and wife, along with their five young children, work together as a family economy to create handmade, natural wooden toys and goods that can be passed down to future generations in small batch organic and wild crafted herbal remedies. From using locally sourced wood to coloring toys with real foods and plants, they deliver various types of wooden products that are coated with only two ingredients, local beeswax and organic expeller pressed coconut oil. Talk about food safe. Their family values include being good stewards, making sure that their products are the highest quality and not harmful to families, homes, or our environment. They also teach free herbalism on their YouTube channel for those wanting to take back what New Agers have tried to distort in worshiping creation rather than the creator. Why support the big companies who knowingly use cheap toxic ingredients because it's better on their pocket when you can get 10% off your order using code BRIGHTHEARTH10, that's all caps, BRIGHTHEARTH10, to support your brothers and sisters in Christ at Rooted Pines Homestead. Check out the show notes for more details and connect with them on social media. Here at Bright Hearth, we're all about helping you not turn into a girl if you're a boy or into a boy if you're a girl. You know what might be doing that to you? The soap in your shower. And so we are pleased to introduce you to indigosundrysoap.com, link in the description, of course, who can provide you with soaps and more without any of the nasty stuff. And because they love you, they're giving you a discount code, guys. So use code, all caps, Bright Hearth for 10% off your whole order. Support this great Christian company and support Bright Hearth Podcast at the same time. Check them out at indigosundrysoap.com. And of course, that link is in the description. So some of this is kind of pie in the sky, admittedly. Most of us are not going to buy a lot and look around on the lot and say, what building materials do I have here? No, 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 and no. And build a home no. with the things. So what are some practical ways that a homemaker can notice the nature of things in the home and make it a more beautiful place? What are some starting points? Because particularly homemakers have an instinct, a God-given instinct, to tend and beautify the home mm -hmm. so that the people want to be there and they like being there. And um, some of you who listen probably have a lot of gifts in designing and making beautiful spaces and things like that. But Lexi, what would you say? As a starting point, I would say as a starting point, just be thankful for what you have and like actually cultivate gratitude for what you have in this year, in this decade, in this home, in this city with these finances mm -hmm. and cheerfully clean your house. <laughs> yeah. Like there's just some sort of joy that comes from being productive with, with the materials God has given you. And then just pray, like ask God to, I was thinking about this the other day, like all the funny prayers of a homemaker, like, Lord, let me find a good deal on jerky today. <laughs> or like, I pray often <laughs> when going to the thrift store, like help me find the things I actually need or help me, you know, keep my eyes open to something beautiful that I can find. Yeah. Um. So just being really specific and personal with praying for those different things in your home. I think those two things can go really, really, really far. Yeah. And so that's really good because one of the things we have to get is that our in, our immediate instinct when we're dissatisfied with mm -hmm. a place because mm -hmm. because there's a there's a good dissatisfaction and I don't mean that like malcontentness 
but a I'm looking at a project that's not yet done. A uh-huh. farmer looking at a field that needs to be tilled and planted is not yet satisfied with his field. He's yeah. thankful for it. He's content in the work before him, but he's now going to go work. But one of the temptations for the homemaker, when she looks at her home and she says, this isn't yet the type of environment that I want to cultivate for my family and for guests and for us to, to live as happy, joyful human beings here in this place that God has given us. A lot of the time, the instinct is thanklessness, yeah, being truly malcontent in the soul, Mm-hmm. Where you go, oh, and then I'm going to be bitter and rude to my husband because I don't have the budget to do all the stuff yeah. I want. And he's he's saying no to me about different projects I want to do and, uh-huh. and things like that. Um, th- the first step is often, outs- again, we talk a lot about the, the attitude of the homemaker. But the next step really is then caring for the things you have. Everything is more beautiful when it's cared for. So are you caring for the things you already have? Make a, li- make a list. Go, th- go through it. And genuinely, I bet you will find that there are five to ten projects or small things that you could do with very minimal cost, just yeah. effort, that would make the home a more beautiful place to be tomorrow. Yeah. yeah I, um, we actually did this a couple months ago where I did do a list of all the projects, like all of my pie-in-the-sky projects for the house. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I put them into three categories. What were the ones that were free? What were the ones I needed Brian's help on? And then what were the ones that cost a lot of money? And I just got to work on all the free ones. And I actually, my sister-in-law is an interior designer and she was telling me yesterday, she does that exact same thing where you always start with the free, free projects. Yeah. <laughs> and all those just, it makes a big difference. And I just think part of it is it's work to do. Yeah. And so you can easily a martyr about this and and you can get like socialist about it and be like well why do they get to have that i want to have that yeah, and i look- want it to be given to me i don't want to have to clean this or i don't want to have to save money to get to a better situation i want that i don't want to have to work really hard and build a business that makes a lot of money you look yeah. at people with more money than you or further down the road or inherited something that you didn't yes have an advantage you didn't and i think with homemaking, you have to be really careful to not let that envy eat you alive because, you know, you might look at a, you know, sister in Christ who seems to have her house more together. And it it's probably because she just cleans more than you do. Like there's no way around the work, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yes. So th- this isn't a hard solution. It's just that we don't want to do it. Yeah. Everything looks better when it's understood and cared for in light of its nature. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about your home and what you'd like it to be and look like and function like, a lot of the time what you're going to find first is that you need to repent of apathy and laziness and wanting to immediately do the the buy your way out of every problem where it's like, if I could just spend $10,000, I could fix everything. (laughs) Well, guess what? You could fill your house with $10,000 worth of more work or furniture. And if you don't care for those things. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It literally. It's going to be six months before it's in disarray. (laughs) This applies to our children. I need to care for my children. Yeah, Things look better when they are cared for. When I, when, you know, when when you help our kids get ready in the morning before school. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's Doug Wilson in my life for yours, where he talks about the importance of wiping a snotty kid's nose. Yes. And just the little tagline him and Nancy have always said is that loveliness bestows. So you need to think like, if you love your child, you want to Mm -hmm. bestow loveliness on them. You want to say to somebody else, my daughter is cared for. I tell, I do. I not tell the kids this all the time. Oh yes, you're not allowed to walk out of the house like that because people will think I don't love you and you look like you came out of a trash can. <laughs> you look like you came out of a trash can. You look like nobody cares for you. And and I tell and them that. And I'll say that. Do, does mommy care about you? Yeah, mommy. Okay, then you can't walk out of the house looking that way. <laughs> and it's interesting. The effect in both directions is cumulative over time. It, it has a runaway effect. So over time. This is true of a friendship, caring for a friendship and caring for a house. It's true for taking care of your car and for taking care of your kids. Is that in both directions, the effects are cumulative over time and amplified over time. So if you don't care for something, it will become neglected and worn in a, before its time and unusable and dingy and sad. And when you look at it, it will do something in your soul 
that will make you feel sad, right? I'm, like <laughs> legitimately. And, and when you care for things, the little things over time, and you put the love and the effort and the elbow grease, and you cultivate and tend and clean and maintain, you can have a very simple environment mm -hmm. that is cared for in that way. Mm -hmm. And over time, the cumulative effect is, um, wow, this place is beautiful. This place has soul. This place has heart. I look at this place and I feel joy. And Lexi and I experience, have been experiencing this in a very obvious way over the last few weeks because we've been looking at homes in our area. We had three kids when we finished building our current little cottage in the little town we live in. And then we have six kids now. So we've been kind of bursting at the seams and we've been looking for, okay, can we, can we maybe move and rent this current home out to someone in the church or how, so we've been looking at all that and where it's brought us as you guys who have been in this process before is walking through a lot of other people's homes. And it is the most depressing thing I've ever done in my life. It is either de wildly depressing or it is so joyful. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Because it's <clears throat> cumulative. So, for example, we walked through this home out, uh, you know, up north, like North Ogden kind of area uh, on, the, on, uh, on the east bench of the mountain. And it was a home from like 1994. I mean, they've got these million dollar plus homes and Utah market's crazy. And it was very simple. It was not like interior designed or anything. It was very simple. Yeah. I mean, so my, uh, my parents actually, there were open houses in the weekend and my parents are weird. They like to go to open houses for fun. I don't really like this. It kind of depresses me, but they like it. So they were going through and they went through like several way hoity twitty, way more expensive homes than we yeah. were even able to look at obviously. And, and then they looked at this home that we had walked through and we had said, man, this home was built in the nineties. Uh, so it's, it's like 30 years old at this point. And but every single thing in it was original and it was beautiful. Like down to the trash compactor appliance was straight out of <laughs> 1994, the tile in the kitchen, e every bathroom, like the light fixtures, the doorways, the hardware, and the doors, everything was straight original 1994. And we loved it because it had such beauty and charm to it. It had been so well cared for and tended. The people that lived there clearly loved being there. They were yeah. trying to make a place where their kid, they had pictures of their kids and grandkids, like you could tell their family had been here. It was lived in, but it was just like, yeah, you felt like home when you walked into it. And a little bit of an aside, but it really does matter. You and my dad made this observation about another house was that people, when they still used real materials, it was actually easier to keep things looking beautiful yeah. longer. As an aside, yeah. yeah. In the 90s, when they put a door in, it was generally a solid wood door. Yeah. When they put hardware in, it was a metal piece of hardware. Now, a lot more things are made of plastic. A lot more things are made cheaply. Hollow doors and everything's corner cut. And how can we maximize efficiency? Yeah. <laughs> because to build one of those 90s materials homes today would cost a million and a half dollars. So you, people cut corners. And then we walked through another house that I needed a shower directly after leaving. Yeah, and, and I'm talking <laughs> houses that were listed for the same price. Nice neighborhoods, both on paper, when you look at the stats, comparable. Like, this house is about the same as this house. But the difference between the two was like 30 years of neglect. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Versus 30 years of care. Yeah. And neither of them had anything flashy about them. There was no feature in either of these homes that was like the, the home we liked. Water wasn't slide. Like, yeah. It didn't have like <laughs> some crazy feature that the other one didn't. They all had rooms and kitchens and tile and bathrooms and home bedrooms and things and yards and whatnot. But I mean, it, so take that picture mm -hmm. and now apply it to anything. The cumulative effects of not noticing the nature of the thing you're working with and caring for it and aim to cultivate its its greatest glory, whether that be a friend or a child or a spouse, um, that neglect will be cumulative, but care will also be cumulative in producing outsized effects, whether towards glory or towards, like, wow, that's depressing, <laughs> towards beauty or towards ugliness. I also want to note that the owner of the beautiful house they were Christians. They were Christians. <laughs> and the owner of the other house was some kind of Indian they were like Hindu. Hindu, something like that. And I couldn't help but think, huh. It's real. 
I really do think, and actually what's funny is, so we're in an area with literally like 2% Christian. I know, it was shocking. Both of the two homes that I think both of us would say, these are homes that like had this, someone had cared for them, both from similar eras, like 1980s or 90s. Both of them were Christians. And they were the only two homes where obviously from the decor, they were Christians. Yeah, that's true. So it was interesting. Like it was a little thing probably nobody else noticed but us. Yeah, well, yeah. Every time my mom saw a pretty house, she was like, you saw that cross though, didn't you? Because in Mormon country, crosses are, you only Mormons have a cross if you're yeah. Protestant or Catholic. That's it. Mormons don't like the symbol of the cross. Yeah. Like it, they don't So it's it. very obvious here yes, who totally. is a Christian. Yeah, so you're, we, we didn't ask the people, but you could, if well, it's an okay. NIV Bible on here, the nightstand. Yes, then, and also you know. I have, I think it's Jonathan Beamer. I have some of his, verse prints he likes to do old school style like stained glass hand-drawn prints yeah i have some prints they had originals hanging in their house yeah they had some originals and i was like what so i know they had to have been christians yeah you know that and they also care about like this beautiful illuminated manuscript type yes, of thing that's yes. not an efficient like spending money on that could seem dumb to somebody but it was like clearly a centerpiece of how they so all of this to say, this might not feel super practical to you. A lot of what we're saying, maybe we're like, okay, Brian and Lexi, we we can't build our home out of sticks we <laughs> find on a lot, or we can't like, if our home is open concept, we can't just start building walls. But you can money. go clean your kitchen sink. That's the point. <laughs> and and take this principle. The most important thing from this episode is actually to understand the principle, and then see how it applies to everything in your life and home. And, and let me give you another one. I mentioned this a couple times, but friendship is like this. This is something my, my, my friend Dan has helped me to understand. Dan is, is a, a, he's a guy who, who cares deeply about loyalty and friendship, and he's a good friend. And you start going, what makes a good friend? Like, what, what is that? Well, a lot of it actually has to do with noticing the nature of the other person that you're working with. And caring and cultivating that friendship in light of their nature. Yeah. And not like be, I think we're easy to be annoyed by that and then to want distance. Yeah. Instead of to find it endearing. Yes. That's exactly what I mean. We're, once you start getting how your friends tick, it, you could, it can make you super annoyed and you can constantly be like rubbed wrong by their, yes. what you now see are flaws. But yes. like Lexi said, you're noticing what seems like, Maybe imperfections or or Im, Im, yeah imperfections is the right word like a knot on a on a big board <laughs> of wood, and if you're a woodworker you can say either like well that board's useless it has a knot in it, or yeah. you can figure out the perfect place in the cabinet to put that piece of wood yeah where that knot is going to add a lot of character and work yeah. with the nature of the thing. Layla Lawler says this principle about kids like when you see something like that in your child and you can <clears throat> laugh about it. That charm will beget more charm over time. Mm-hmm. I think it's the same with friendships. Yeah, everybody needs to learn how to see themselves accurately in their yeah. own little foibles and faults and tendencies to sin too. And learn how to laugh at yourself, not take yourself yes. too seriously, repent of your sins, and also deal graciously and mercifully with your with your friends. And that's where beauty comes from. Like that's where beauty and glory and peace comes from, is not essentially doing what modernism does, which is steamrolls everything. It doesn't care about the nature of anything. It steamrolls over everything and imposes its view of nature on everything. It says, this is how it should be. And not in a way that's tending a garden, but it's like Saruman in the two towers, tearing down the beautiful fields and veils of Orthanc and replacing it with... um, minds and machines and ugliness. He wasn't understanding the nature of what he was working with. Mm -hmm. Any last words, babe, on this subject? I could keep going on, but I probably shouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) It's getting late. So things must be made understood and cared for in light of their nature. Um, They have to be understood by somebody who's willing to make a careful study of them and tend them and cultivate them to beauty. This applies to the way you decorate your house, and it applies to the way you love your children. It applies to your friendships. It applies to your marriage. It applies to nearly every aspect of life. Once you start to look for this principle in operation, you will see what we're talking about more and more when it comes to cultivating 
beauty and truth and goodness in your life and household around you. Uh, Let me leave you here with just a few quick notes. The first is that we have a conference coming up in June. We'd love to have you join us for June 6th to the 8th here in Ogden, Utah. Right now, we're uh, more than 600, nearly 700 folks uh, set to attend, and we would love to have you join us as well. We've got plenty of room for you and your family. Uh, Head to newchristianimpress.com slash conference, and you can get uh, details on that. And uh, we also have a singles mixer. I'm going to be putting on a live concert on the Friday night and a lot more that's going to be going on that weekend And hey, guys, if you're going to come, try to stay for the 9th, which is the Sunday, because we're going to have our church service actually in the same venue where we are meeting, which, speaking of beauty, is an absolutely beautiful building built in the 30s, um, right on the east bench of Ogden, just up the the road from our church. It's this beautiful Art Deco, um, like castle-style high school with an amazing auditorium with wood and leather chairs. It's, It's going to be great. So we'd love to have you guys Join us for that June 6th through the 8th, and if you like Bright Hearth, you like the content that we're putting out, and you'd like to help us continue to make more of it, we would invite you to join us uh, as a patron on Patreon at patreon.com slash brighthearth, and we have lots of thank you sort of gifts for folks who sign up there. Um, We have a patron-exclusive show called In the Kitchen, where Lexi or Lexi and I will talk about all sorts of granular things, practical applications of what we're talking about in the episodes. Right now, one of the things Lexi's doing is going through a Roger Scruton book on beauty that we think is really, really interesting and compelling. And so she's walking through that chapter by chapter. You can join us there on Patreon and not only get some of that, uh, you know, perks and bonuses, but also hopefully just help continue to uh, support this show and make it possible. Uh, But that's all we've got, guys. Remember that in all of this, make haste slowly. Fest in Alente. None of this is, you're not going to cultivate beauty in afternoon, but you can start. And so make haste. Don't wait. But do make haste slowly and take your time over the years. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bright Hearth, and we hope we'll catch you next time.